Welcome to the second part of today's colloquium. Uh, we have Mark Gellek from University of California, San Diego. Uh, Mark is Associate Professor of Linguistics at uh, UC San Diego, and he received his PhD from UC Los Angeles uh, uh, in 2013. His research uh, lies in phonetics and laboratory phonology, and uh, he works extensively on phonation types and voice qualities, and in particular, how the voice contributes meaningful information to spoken language. Uh, he's been working extensively on the Hmong language and also other languages uh, uh, in the Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, personally, I uh, actually like his chapter uh, titled The Phonetics of Voice in the Rutledge Handbook of Phonetics uh, that was published in 2019. So if you want to have a good overview of the phonetics of voice, I strongly recommend that chapter. Uh, uh, and the chapter, uh, and one of the reasons is because it uh, gives you a lot of uh, um, seeds for thoughts uh, related to uh, uh, phonation and voice. So Mark, it's good to have you at today's colloquium. Uh, he will talk about voicing of glottal consonant. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and share my slides and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. And thank you for having you. <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> my pleasure. Okay. So, can everyone see my slides now? Yes, we can see. Okay. You. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so the title of this talk is uh, Voicing of Glottal Consonants. Um, this is work done in collaboration with three graduate students at UCSD, Yuan Chai, Yatian Huang, and Maxime Van Doren. Um, and the work I'm going to be presenting today is based off of um, work of ours that has recently um, been accepted to appear in, in Journal of the IPA and JIPA. And so there's a link on this slide to uh, a preprint of that paper um, if you'd like to get more details about the project. Okay, so to start off, um, just a little bit of background on voicing um, as it occurs in glottal consonants. If we look just at the International Phonetic Alphabet, we'll see that there are three glottal consonants that are distinguished and that they differ um, in voicing. So there is the voiceless glottal stop, the voiceless glottal fricative, and the voiced or breathy voiced glottal fricative um, schematized or transcribed with a uh, hook top H. But we also know that voiceless glottal consonants are frequently realized as voiced sounds. And when they're realized as voiced sounds, especially adjacent to a vowel, they'll be realized as um, a non-modal, breathy or, or creaky vowel. So for example, the so-called voiceless glottal stop is known to vary quite freely between a voiceless glottal stop and a creaky vowel when adjacent to another vowel. The voiceless glottal fricative will vary quite systematically between a voiceless glottal fricative H, a breathy voiced glottal fricative or hook top H, um, and the breathy voiced glottal fricative is um, identical to a breathy vowel. Um, so we see examples of this in Latifogan and Madison Sounds of the World's Languages. This is an example from Lebanese Arabic of intervocalic glottal stop uh, undergoing uh, voicing and being realized as a creaky vowel transition between the A ah and the E. Um, and in a now famous quote by Latifogan and Madison, they say that in the great majority of languages we have heard, glottal stops are apt to fall short of complete closure, especially in intervocalic positions. So this idea that glottal stops are frequently voiced is, is well acknowledged. The same is true for the voiceless H. Um, in Sounds of the World's Languages, Latifogan and Madison provide this example from Gimme, a Papuan language of an intervocalic H that is realized with continuous voicing throughout. And they say that the waveform for the intervocalic H is that of a breathy voice hooktop H um, and is similar to the intervocalic hooktop H in English behold. Um, and this issue of voicing of glottal consonants, systematic voicing of voiceless glottal consonants has been a vexing issue since the early days of the IPA. Um, as early as 1900, Passy um, wrote in response to a recent um, monograph by Ernst Meyer showing that H's are frequently voiced in, in languages, particularly of Western Europe. Um, Passy mentioned this was in the, the journal Le Maître Phonétique, the um, precursor to JIPA, um, when articles were written in uh, the IPA. Um, so I've included the original quotation in IPA, the French uh, transliteration for those of you who speak French, and then the English quote is, 
But then if voiceless H can be voiced without ceasing to be voiceless H, what is the difference between voiceless H and voiced H? Right, so we have this fundamental problem of the voiceless H being regularly voiced, but we also have this additional symbol of a voiced H. So what is the difference between these sounds? Um, a further complication to the matter uh, lies with the uh, non-modal vowels. The idea being that breathy and creaky vowels, even though they're vowels and are typically voiced, they often also show systematic variation in their voicing. So for example, in San Juan Galavia Zapotec, uh, an Otomangayan language, the creaky or laryngealized vowels will alternate systematically between being creaky throughout versus rearticulated with a glottal stop, voiceless glottal stop like uh, articulation in the middle of the vowel, um, or checked where the glottal constriction leads to voicelessness at the end of the vowel. In Gujarati, uh, breathy vowels are often breathiest in the middle of the vowel, and at least in controlled speech, that breathiness can devoice to an H. Uh, in Itunyo Sotriki, another um, Otomangayan language, the voiced H often devoices to voiceless H, at least in careful speech. And um, there are reported cross-speaker differences in the way the glottal fricative is realized in Nepali, where some speakers produce the sound, the glottal fricative is voiced and others voiceless. Okay, so here's the picture that we have of voicing and, and glottal consonants um, and just elaborated a bit further. So we have systematic variation in voicing for the so-called voiceless glottal stop, systematic variation in voicing for the so-called voiceless glottal fricative, and the voice glottal fricative can also vary quite systematically between being voiced versus voiceless. So the question for today is, do voiceless and voiced glottal consonants differ in their voicing? And if so, how do they differ in their voicing? So I'll address this by looking at sounds as they occur in illustrations of the IPA. These are short papers with audio that are published in Journal of the IPA, where the audio is freely available for research purposes. Um, and the expectation here, the kind of, um, the silly kind of expectation is that we expect the glottal consonants that are transcribed as being voiceless to be less voiced than those that are transcribed as being voiced, which include the hooktop H, the breathy voiced H, as well as non-modal vowels. Uh, before I go into the data, I wanna talk a little bit more about why we see so much variation in voicing, in particular for the glottal consonants. Um, so first off, it's useful to schematize uh, glottal consonants and non-modal vowels along a single continuum of glottal stricture or glottal opening. Um, and this is a, a single continuum for both the glottal consonants and the, the non-modal vowels. So this is a modified version of the continuum model um, in Latifoglid in 1971 and in Gordon and Latifoglid's now classic paper on, on non-modal uh, phonation across languages. So on the left of the continuum, we have the most open glottis. Um, on the right, we have the most closed glottis. So at the extremes, we have H and voiceless glottal stop. And then as we go closer and closer to the middle of the continuum, we have non-modal vowels, breathy and creaky vowels, as well as the voiced H, which is assumed to be the same as breathy vowels in terms of uh, glottal opening. And in the middle of the continuum, we have modal vowels. Now, I should note that this continuum obscures a great deal of information about how these sounds are articulated, um, especially in terms of the uh, laryngeal mechanism involved in particular for sounds that have constriction. Um, but for our purposes today, it's, it's sufficiently explanatory. Um, another reason why there's systematic voicing variation for glottal consonants is that the production of a voiceless glottal consonant, either H or glottal stop, necessarily entails non-modal voicing. So to explain that, I'm going to schematize what the vocal folds look like when we're producing these sounds. Let's say we're taking a bird's eye view, a laryngoscopic bird's eye view of the glottis during the production of an ah. So that's represented here. Um, at the top of the circle, we have the front of the vocal folds. The bottom of the circle is the back of the vocal folds. I represented the back of the vocal folds here with a slight glottal gap, a space between the folds, though it's not necessary for there to be a gap. And the squiggly line in the circle is meant to illustrate that the vocal folds are vibrating. So that's what our vocal folds will look like if we're producing an ah and ignoring the supraglottal um, vocal tract. 
Then to produce an H, the vocal folds would look like the following. This is an H with the tongue in configuration for an A. Uh, and so this H is essentially identical to a devoiced A. Uh. The vocal folds are going to be widely spread. Um, there's going to be a big gap between the folds and no squiggly lines suggesting no voicing at all. And then if we have a sequence like aha, then we go back to the original state of the first a. The question is though, what happens as we go from the first a vowel to an h and then back into the next a? What we get are these in-between states um, of the glottis where the vocal folds are more spread apart than they would be for the modal vowel um, and breathiness uh, ensues. So breathiness here is represented with a squiggly line in blue. The vocal folds are more widely spread apart because the glottis is opening. And so that's this increased space that we see at the bottom of a, uh, a, a schematic for a breathy vowel. So to go from a vowel that's modal to an H and then back to a modal vowel, we necessarily have to produce a period of breathiness. And the same would be true for a glottal stop, just in the opposite direction with increased constriction. Other reasons why we have a lot of variation in voicing for glottal sounds um, is, uh, would relate to issues of articulatory strength and reduction. So if we have a voiceless target that is undershot, for example, due to reduction, then what we get is non-modal voicing because the undershoot leads to a weaker gesture along that glottal continuum. Um, now, prosodic strengthening, on the other hand, would lead to a more extreme articulation generally, so more spreading for um, a sound that's spread glottis, more constriction for a sound that's constricted glottis, and this could lead in turn uh, a very strong realization of a voiced glottal sound, like a, a breathy voiced H or non-modal vowel, could cause these sounds to devoice. Um, so that's represented here. We have um, prosodic strengthening in blue, where the non-modal vowels, if they are produced with increased articulatory force, they would be pulled towards the edges of this continuum model, um, leading to devoicing. In contrast, if we have the voiceless glottal sounds, H and glottal stop at the edges of the continuum, and um, they're produced with, um, with less articulatory strength, meaning they're reduced, then they'll be brought towards the midline of this continuum and therefore be voiced. Now, we also expect variation in voicing on account of pressure changes over the course of the utterance. Um, so for example, utterance initially, we um, voicelessness is favored because the subglottal pressure is low. So it is hard to initiate voicing, relatively hard. Um, but utterance medially, where the subglottal pressure is high, the high subglottal pressure will favor voicing over voicelessness unless additional articulations um, are used to render the sound voiceless. Utterance, finally, we expect a mixture of voicing, um, which I won't get into now, but if you have questions in the question period, I'll be happy to, to address them because I will be talking about utterance final position. Um, and of course, there are other factors that could um, influence whether there is, uh, whether a, a glottal sound is uh, voiced or not. One major factor would be coarticulation. So adjacent to a voiceless sound, a voiced sound is likely to be slightly, um, slightly more voiced. Okay, so now let's get to the, um, the data itself in illustrations of the IPA. So illustrations are IPA, of the IPA are published by uh, JIPA, but earlier some of them appeared in the handbook of the IPA. We looked um, today, uh, for, in this project, we looked at illustrations of the IPA that were published from the, the dawn of illustrations in the late 80s up until the start of 2021. Um, and this included, in the end, just over 1,300 tokens from over 131 languages. Now, I'll just lay out some advantages and disadvantages of using illustrations of the IPA for, for such a study. Um, main advantages are that the audio tends to be high quality um, from a variety of languages. The words are uttered in isolation, which would allow for a more canonical pronunciation. Often uh, illustrations include minimal pairs, so that minimizes the effect of adjacent phonological environment on the production of these glottal sounds. And uh, the transcriptions are peer reviewed, so we could be reasonably confident that the transcriptions provided in the text um, align with the audio. Some major disadvantages though of using illustrations include the fact that there are very few tokens per language. 
Usually there's just one speaker for a given language. Sometimes for some illustrations, we don't know if there are multiple speakers, which speaker said which token. And we don't have any information generally of the recording uh, uh, setup. Okay, um, but looking at the target sounds, these are the sounds that we uh, pulled out in illustrations. We took out the glottal consonants, so any glottal stop, voiceless H or voiced H, as well as breathy and creaky vowels. And by creaky vowels, we included any of the following descriptions. So vowels that were described as being either laryngealized or creaky. In those cases, they tended to be vowels that were creaky throughout their duration. We articulated or glottalized vowels tended to be vowels that had a glottal constriction associated with the, the middle, uh, the mid phase of the vowel. And checked vowels were those that had glottalization associated or constriction associated with the end of the vowel. Um, we excluded any sounds that um, have epiglottalization or um, constriction downstream from the glottis um, because those would influence, uh, those types of constriction would influence voicing. And also in order to minimize other effects on um, voicing, we analyzed only words in isolation so that we excluded words that appear in the passage, usually the North Wind and the Sun passage. And we only included three particular positions in an utterance, which are also positions in a word. There's initial position, for example, the, an H at the beginning of a word. Medial position, so for example, an intervocalic H or a breathy vowel that appeared in the middle of a word. And final position, a word final H, um, or a breathy vowel that appeared at the end of a word in an open syllable. So those are the three main prosodic environments that we'll be looking at here. Okay, for segmentation purposes, we defined uh, two intervals, an aspiration interval and a glottalization interval. Aspiration interval was um, where either F1 or F2 is excited by noise rather than by um, uh, voicing. Glottalization interval was where the F0 is irregular or where there's full glottal occlusion, so a full glottal stop. You can see an example of that um, in the spectrograms and waveforms uh, below. These are two examples of words from uh, Northwest Sahaptin, which is a language spoken in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, on the left, we have a token of a glottal stop that has both irregular voicing on the edges and full glottal occlusion in the middle. So there's a full stop. Um, and then on the right, we have an example of a glottal stop that was realized with irregular voicing throughout, but no period of sustained glottal closure. Okay, for the analysis, I'm going to focus on two measures of voicing. We have percentage of voicing during that interval. This was measured uh, through Pratt and the intensity of voicing during that interval. And the intensity of voicing was measured uh, using strength of excitation. Uh, which is a measure of energy in the signal um, associated with voicing alone, rather than overall energy, which would combine voicing energy from voicing and energy from, from the noise. Um, and we normed SOE by language such that um, the highest values were the strongest voicing present in the language and, and the lowest values were voiceless. Okay, so here are some results for aspirated sounds for percentage voicing. So on the y-axis, we have 0 to 100% voicing over the interval. And I've blocked the data into three prosodic positions. The first facet on the left is initial position, for example, an intervocalic H. Medial position, so an in, um, sorry, in initial position, a word initial H. Medial position, an intervocalic H. And word final position would be a word final H, or a breathy vowel in an open syllable. Um, in each facet on the x-axis, we have the three uh, target sounds, H, voiceless H in orange, voiced H in blue, and breathy vowels uh, in green. In initial position, we had no breathy vowels because in this, um, in this corpus, there were no instances of words that began with a breathy vowel um, without an, uh, an onset. Now, each dot here refers to a given token. Um, and so looking at the facet on the left, initial position, you'll notice for voiceless H, we have tokens that are 0% voiced, so they have no voicing during the interval. Um, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, we have some tokens here that have 100% voicing during the aspiration interval, and we have tokens with voicing percentages going from 0 to 100. So really the whole range um, of data of percentage voicing uh, is attested. And on average, the voicing um, is about 30% of the interval. So voiceless H in initial position is on average voiced for 30% of the time. 
For voice stage in the initial position, we see similar results, but there are much fewer, um, there are fewer data points. We have, not surprisingly, tokens with 100% voicing, surprisingly tokens with 0% voicing, and we have tokens that have anywhere between 0 to 100% voicing. Um, and what's interesting for voice stage is that the percentage voicing on average is below 50%. So so-called voiced age on average in this uh, corpus is voiced less than 50% of the time. Now, if we look at medial position, we see that generally the voicing percentage is very high during the interval. So all sounds have voicing for most of the interval. Voiceless H is slightly lower, but we have many more tokens for voiceless H than for voiced H or breathy vowels. And so it's likely that with more, with a larger data set, we would actually have a wider spread for the voiced H and the breathy vowels. Um, but for voiceless H now, the percentage voicing is um, well over 75% of the interval is voiced. In final position, we have a slight decrease in percentage voicing for voices H, but still over 50% of the interval is voiced. Um, and for voiced H and breathy vowels, we see now a wider spread of data, but still mostly voiced throughout the interval. So that's percentage voicing. Let's take a look now at um, the intensity of the voicing measured with SOE, uh, strength of excitation. So these are norm values, one means the strongest voicing present in a language and zero indicates the weakest voicing, essentially no voicing in the language. Um, I'm showing you now, um, these are time courses. So each facet from zero to one means beginning to end of the interval. Looking at H here alone, so this is voiceless H in initial position, there is very little energy in voicing. So essentially voiceless for most of the duration, but starting at about um, two thirds of the way through the interval, there is a rapid increase in the intensity of voicing. In medial position, the voiceless H starts out with strong voicing and ends with strong voicing, but has a slight dip in the intensity of voicing in the middle. But notice that the dip in intensity of voicing goes nowhere near the low values we see for word initial H. In final position, the uh, voiceless H starts out with very strong voicing. Um, and then there's this kind of logarithmic like drop off in the intensity of voicing as the H unfolds, as the aspiration unfolds. So looking at these uh, trajectories here, let's now compare them to the voiced H, which are the following. In initial position, we see a slight difference between voiced H and voiceless H. The voiced H um, has a more linear increase in intensity of voicing than voiceless H. But interestingly, the beginning of the voice stage and the end of the voice stage has about the same intensity, average intensity of voicing as voiceless H. So both voiceless and voiced H in initial position start and end with similar intensities of voicing, um, but it's the um, trajectory, the slope of these changes that um, where the differences may lie. In medial position, we really don't see much of a difference between voiceless and voiced H, um, nor do we see much of a difference in final position. In these positions, both sounds are very likely to be voiced, as we saw in the previous slide, and the voicing pattern, uh, the intensity of the voicing pattern that we see here is very similar. Looking at the breathy vowels, we see a similar uh, pattern here in medial position, strong voicing throughout, but there's a little bit of a dip um, at the end. And in final position, there's also a decrease in the intensity of voicing as expected, but the decrease is less steep. Okay, now let's take a look at glottalized sounds uh, for percentage voicing. Here we have more categories because we separated creaky vowels into where the creaky, where the glottalization was occurring. Um, so we have glottal stops in initial position, but we don't have creaky vowels in initial position in this corpus. Um, what you can see is similar to the H's that we saw, the glottal fricatives, we have some tokens with 0% voicing over the glottalization interval. Other tokens, perhaps surprisingly, with 100% voicing, and there are plenty of tokens with percentage voicing that uh, span zero to 100. In this case, the average percentage voicing for a, a word initial glottal stop is about 50%, just over 50. In word medial environment, the glottal stop has a higher percentage voicing, now at 75%, but still there are tokens with 100 and 0% voicing. Um, the creaky vowels, those are vowels that were creaky throughout, have, have more voicing, uh, closer to ceiling at 
Um, and vowels that are called checked or rearticulated have an intermediate percentage voicing from the creaky vowel and the glottal stop. Still very strongly um, a high percentage of voicing for all these categories. Now in final position, the glottal stop shows a decrease in percentage voicing, but still over 50% of the time on average, um, there's voicing during the glottalization interval. Creaky vowels are, are, um, have voicing throughout most of the interval and checked and rearticulated are kind of intermediate again between the creaky vowels and the glottal stops. Moving on to the, uh, the intensity of voicing uh, trajectories here, the time courses measured through SOE. Here are the data for glottal stops. We see that glottal stops show kind of a linear increase from beginning to end of the glottalization interval where voicing is either absent or quite weak at the beginning and quite strong at the end. In medial position, we have strong voicing at the beginning, a dip in the middle of the glottalization, uh, and the dip here is quite substantial. It goes close to the um, low level that we see for word initial glottal stop. And in final position, the glottal stop shows kind of a logarithmic drop in voicing intensity. Now, if we compare these trajectories to creaky vowels here in red, we see that the creaky vowels in this corpus show very little drop in intensity in medial position. In final position, however, there is a drop in intensity, though it is nowhere near as steep as what we see for the glottal stops. Um, here we're looking at rearticulated trajectories in um, kind of a grayish blue. Um, the, in medial position, the rearticulated vowels, which have a uh, constriction in the middle of the vowel, look very similar to an intervocalic glottal stop. They start out with strong voicing, they end in strong voicing, but the middle of the vowel is where you see a dip in voicing intensity. Um, at the ends of, uh, in word final position, rearticulated vowels seem to show a slight earlier dip in voicing intensity, and they, the vowels never recover, so to speak, from that dip in intensity. The uh, intensity plateaus at quite a low value. And then finally, the checked vowels show a later drop in in voicing intensity in both medial and final position. And in final position, checked vowels look very similar in voicing intensity to glottal stops in word final position, which isn't uh, that surprising. Okay, um, so to summarize the results, we see that voiceless glottal stop and H show a wide range in percentage voicing as well as changes in the strength of voicing. And except in initial position, utterance and word initial position, the voiceless H is actually mostly voiced, despite being transcribed as voiceless. In initial position, both voiceless and voiced H have less than 50% voicing during their intervals, and really only differ slightly in terms of voicing intensity. Recall that they start and end with similar voicing intensities on average. Vowels that are labeled as creaky or laryngealized tend to have more voicing and stronger voicing than those vowels that are labeled as checked or rearticulated. Um, and those vowels that are labeled as checked and rearticulated behave similarly to glottal stops in almost all respects. So they do have a tendency for slightly stronger voicing. Okay, so now moving on to the discussion, um, I'm gonna talk about the implications of these results for how we describe and analyze glottal consonants in languages of the world. Let's return to Passy's uh, question from back in 1900, where he asked, but then if voiceless H can be voiced without ceasing to be voiceless H, what is the difference between voiceless and voiced H? So if voicing differences between these two sounds exist, then they're slight in this corpus. And this is relevant because this corpus, illustrations of the IPA, have very controlled, perhaps hyperarticulated realizations of these sounds. And so if under hyperarticulation, these sounds do not differ very much, then they are unlikely to differ in more spontaneous, uh, in corpora with more spontaneous speech styles. But if there are systematic differences between these sounds in terms of voicing, the voicing differences are likely to be strongest at utterance onsets rather than in utterance medial or final positions. Now let's recall that there is predictable voicing variation for glottal sounds. So prosodic modulation, strengthening, weakening would predict less voicing domain initially, um, but more voicing elsewhere. Because in strong prosodic positions, like at the onsets of a prosodic domain, we have a tendency towards more forceful articulations, bringing the glottal sounds towards the edges of the continuum, which is voiceless 
Um, and there's the modulations in subglottal pressure that we see over the course of an utterance are going to predict very similar findings. We expect less voicing utterance initially due to low subglottal pressure. Utterance medially, we expect more voicing because the subglottal pressure is high and favors voicing. Um, so this causes us to rethink perhaps how we describe glottal sounds as they occur. Um, the continuum model from uh, Latifoged and Gordon Latifoged uh, 2001 tends to overfit for many languages. So the continuum model is shown here again. Most languages have only one spread glottis fricative um, and they have only one constricted glottis stop. Um, and so if they're, they only have one of these sounds and these sounds differ uh, vary systematically in terms of their voicing, we might not need to specify the voicing for these sounds if the voicing variation is predictable based on strengthening, weakening, and respiratory factors. Moreover, if we look at languages with non-modal vowels, generally, though not always, these languages do not contrast degrees of non-modal phonation, um, at least not independent of its phasing. So for example, Zapotec languages that have two constricted vowels will often have a contrast between a vowel that is laryngealized and weakly creaky throughout the duration, whereas uh, the checked vowels tend to be more strongly glottalized, but also glottalized um, the glottalization is phased towards the end of the vowel. So there's a difference in degree of the constriction, but there's also a difference in phasing that presumably helps uh, keep these categories distinct. For many languages, those that only have one type of glottal fricative or one glottal stop, we, we might only need to assume two articulatory gestures, which I'm calling here aspiration and glottalization. Aspiration would be if we use the glottal continuum as a um, as a way of depicting this, aspiration would be the tendency to move towards increased vocal fold spreading, and glottalization is the tendency to move towards increased vocal fold or laryngeal constriction. But the degree of aspiration or glottalization, that is where we end up landing on this continuum ultimately, um, can be largely predicted by prosodic and respiratory factors. So to conclude, we see that voicing variation for glottal consonants is frequent and very often predictable. For many languages, the phonetic description and phonological analysis of voicing in the glottal consonants might be overly complex by over-specifying voicing when it is in fact predictable on phonetic grounds. To simplify, we might wanna say that if a language just has a glottal stop, that it is glottalization, it's pure and simple without specifying whether it's voiceless or voiced. If, it, if a language has a glottal fricative, it's aspiration without specifying if it's voiceless or voiced because there isn't generally a contrast. Now, whether a glottal consonant is considered to be voiced or voiceless um, should then be based off of the phonological patterning first, whether the sound patterns as a voiced consonant versus a voiceless one, but not on the presence of phonetic voicing if the presence of phonetic voicing is attributed to respiratory or uh, prosodic factors. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it was great uh, to hear about or make us rethink about the H uh, and a little bit of phonology towards the end. <laughs> so I like it. Uh, so uh, we have some questions already. Uh, the first question will come from uh, Tomohiko Oigawa uh, at New Nihon University. Please unmute yourself. and. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, I forgot to. Ah, oh, we can see. I forgot you. to, to yeah. do that. Uh, can you can you uh, see me? Yes. yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Um, I my question is uh, a little bit away from voicing, so I'm sorry for the first question. Uh, my questions is: uh, Are glottal consonants are really consonants? Uh, I teach very uh, uh, basic phonetics uh, in Japan, and according to the uh, very general this uh, definition, consonants are uh, uh, consonants are uh, no. When we produce consonants, uh, somewhere in the uh, vocal cavity is narrowed, but for the glottal consonants, where is narrowed. So it means that the uh, the glot 
glottis itself included in the vocal cavity. So, for example, uh, breathy voices are relatively closed. Uh, uh, they are, mm, if, if we compare to breathing, and freaky, uh, sorry, glottofricative is uh, a little bit closed. Uh, anyway, so what is your, so I mean, how can I explain as a consonant uh, H and glotto stop? Sorry for my long question. No, that's a great question. Um, we talk about this actually in, in our paper a little bit more. Um, I think there was, you raise an excellent point, and this point has been raised um, many times over the years. Most recently, um, the issue of whether glottal sounds are really um, fricatives and stops in the first place, um, that was raised most recently in shortly after the, the Kiel Convention that revised, um, that had a major revision of the IPA. Um, and so there, there was a bunch of discussion that appeared in Journal of the IPA um, starting around 1990 through 1992 about how we describe the glottal stop in H um, in terms of whether they are stops and fricatives at all um, versus approximants um, and um, whether there's also issues, of course, whether we should consider them to be glottal versus laryngeal, but it's clear that they're not consonants like other consonants for the reasons that, that you rightly explain. Um, and so this issue is, is, is quite tricky. I would say that we should call them consonants if they behave, if they pattern as consonants in a language. But I think what we can see here is, for example, a vowel that's rearticulated, that has glottal constriction in the middle um, of its duration, is essentially the same thing as, an in, as a glottal stop that appears intervocalically. We see the same patterns of um, how much, what percentage voicing there is, um, and how intense that voicing is, uh, or very similar patterns. And so really phonetically, there's nothing different from a rearticulated vowel, which has a glottal constriction in the middle, and a vowel glottal stop vowel sequence. The difference is only in terms of analysis. We treat a rearticulated vowel as one unit that is vocalic, um, but we treat an intervocalic glottal stop as a vowel plus a glottal stop plus another vowel. So it's really a question of a phonological analysis, not a question of phonetic realization. From the point of view of phonetic realization, it's clear that glottal, glottal consonants are not like other supralaryngeal uh, consonants. Um, they're, um, I think we missed an opportunity to revise our description of the glottal sounds. Um, Latifoget in 1990, I believe, maybe 91, suggested moving them out of the consonant chart entirely and putting them under special symbols as approximants. Um, and I think we, we, we probably missed a good opportunity there um, because in fact, they are not consonants like every other consonant. And so that should be recognized phonetically, though there, even back in the 90s, there was argument, there were arguments put in uh, favor of keeping the glottal consonants in their current place in the IPA chart because they are honorary consonants, so to speak, right? They um, behave in many languages, phonologically, they behave as any other consonant. But phonetically, it's clear that they're that we're dealing with a very different type of sound. Uh Thank, thank you very much. A lot of information. Uh, yeah, so far I teach to my students. These are exceptional and controversial. Thank you very much. So good. Uh, thank you, uh, Oigawa-san. Uh, next question comes from Mark Brunel, University of Ottawa. Apologies. Uh, very interesting talk. I have a Two short questions about uh, the voice low, well, H and the voice to H. So, is there any language in which you have a contrast between voiceless low fricatives and voice low fricatives? Um, it's yes, they're, they're, these contrasts are reported. They're often um, uh, somewhat controversial. So, for example, the Wu languages of um, uh, Chinese languages typically have a surface contrast between voiceless and voice H but this is part of the broader register contrast in the language. And so it's unclear whether they differ systematically in voicing. Um, it's clear that they differ systematically in terms of the register in which they occur. Um, the same is true for um, the Nguni languages of Southern Africa, languages like Zulu and Kosa that have a purported voiceless H and voiced H, um, but the voiced H belongs to the set of depressor consonants that lower F zero, 
the voiceless H uh, does not. And so it's unclear if they really differ systematically in terms of their voicing, um, but they do differ in terms of their phonological patterning on uh, tone and, and F0 more generally. So I, what I'm hoping this, this um, paper does is stimulate more interest in uh, systematically looking at voicing during these glottal fricatives, um, because we really have very little data across languages for how um, voicing is realized in glottal fricatives. And do we know any anything about the the phonetic patterning of uh, of uh, of these two types of fricatives and languages in which they seem to be quasi distinctive? No, not to my knowledge. So um, even the study of I'm I'm thinking of a trail at all study of Zulu um, depressor versus non depressor consonants that included H. Um, not a systematic doesn't include a systematic study of the voicing during the the breathy voiced H. Um, in the Wu languages that um, the work that I'm familiar with in, uh, from Wu languages like Shanghainese, um, they tend to focus on the effects of uh, the register for the constant for the stops in particular, but not the glottal fricatives. And so we really have a shortage of information uh, for uh, about how voicing is realized during aspiration. And just a follow-up question. Is it possible that the duration of the fricatives explains to some extent why phoneticians distinguish the voice and the, vo the, 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 the voiceless fricatives, even though their transcriptions don't seem to be any consistent with, with uh, phonetic properties? Um, yeah, I do think that's a possibility. So for example, if a language tends to, ha tends to have a long aspiration, word medially, um, intervocalically, then the longer the aspiration goes on for, the more likely we are to have devoicing. Um, whereas if the, if the aspiration tends to be quite short, then there's really very little opportunity for the uh, spreading, the global spreading to uh, inhibit voicing. So there's probably quite a bit of covariation between um, duration of the aspiration and voicing. Another issue that's that's clearly problematic in the cases of illustrations is that if a language doesn't have word initial H at all, just medial H or final H, we we can see from from this study that those glottal fricatives tend to be voiced, and so the choice of symbol, let's say a voiced H, could be based on the fact that this glottal fricative only occurs in environments that phonetically favor voicing, but it might have nothing to do with you know a specification for voicing uh, per se. Mm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we still have some time for question or one or two, uh, one short question or anything. Yeah. Oh, can I ask you your opinion about uh, like using this phonetic facts for uh, establishing a phonological feature system, for example? You just uh, touched upon that towards the end. Like, okay, the description or the environment where we see the voice fricative is voicing, so it's uh, transcribed as voice fricative uh, because it always is there and it's reported as uh, being part of the consonantal inventory. But then uh, phonological uh, uh, analysis would actually say there's a voice plus voice plus fricative, we need to do something about this. And like, how how do you see these kind of uh, phonetic findings or like phonetic system uh, aligning, aligning with the phonological analysis that uh, linguists try to put together. Maybe it's a much bigger question that it's <laughs> a little bit going away from uh, the essence of your talk. But no, I think it's yeah, I think it's quite appropriate actually to ask. And and um, my my takeaway from this work is that. Um, the decision about how we, you know, describe a sound phonologically should be based on the phonological patterning, the behavior. Um, the phonetic information here could be very uninformative is in, unless we already account for the kind of predictable phonetic in, um, effects, things like prosodic strengthening and, and respiratory factors like subglottal pressure. If we factor those things out and we still have, let's say, an intervocalic H in a language that's consistently voiceless, um, then perhaps there is phonetic, at least, specification for voicelessness on that sound. But again, whether it's phonologically voiced or voiceless should depend on phonological patterns, not on um, primarily on phonological patterns and not on the presence of voicing. So a good case, I think, would be English H and aspirated stops. 
Um, at least for English H, we don't have a contrast um, between voiced and voiceless H. We typically transcribe it as voiceless, um, at least at a phonemic level, but um, because it tends to occur word initially and utterance initially, that's, those are the environments where the H is gonna be voiceless. Now, in the middle of a phrase, English H tends to be voiced. Um, so in the example that Lada, Fogan, and Madison uh, provide in Sounds of the World's Languages, they mention behold, where the H is likely to be voiced, it's also intervocalic. So we expect the voicing on uh, phonetic grounds due to, um, in this case, high subglottal pressure in the middle of the utterance. Right. Um, so do we need to specify that it's a voiceless glottal fricative in English? Well, the question is, does the H, for me at least, the question is, does the H pattern as a voiceless sound or a voiced one? And I think the, the phonological literature for English, at least, is, is quite mixed in terms of whether we need to specify it as voiceless or not. I don't think anyone's posited that we should specify it as voiced, but there are arguments in favor of under-specification, where there's, it's just, say, spread glottis, um, and there are arguments in favor of saying it's both spread glottis and uh, minus voice. Um, but it could be a tricky question in a language like English where the aspirations voicing is, seems to be largely dependent on uh, phonetic factors that are easily predictable. Yep. So thank you. Thank you for uh, <coughs> sharing it <laughs> openly about uh, uh, this point. Uh, let's thank uh, Mark uh, one more time and we will continue uh, our discussion after the end of the session. Uh, let me wrap up the session first. Uh, I would like to thank the co-host of this series, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mizda at ICU, as well as two assistants, Yuki Baldoria and Miyo Izuka, as well as the Liaison Institute Assistant Michinori Suzuki. This event was supported by the shared budget of ICU Research Institutes and Institute for Education Research and Service and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Uh, the next part of this ICU Linguistic Colloquium will be next week on Saturday by Elizabeth Seeger from Georgetown University and Christopher Green from Syracuse University. We also have a phonetic talk series, uh, the last one, uh, that will, ha be, ha uh, that will uh, uh, be going on uh, next Monday on June 7th, uh, and it's Sunday in North America. Uh, Jonah uh, Katz from West Virginia University and Rebecca Starr from National University of Singapore will share the research. Uh, you can find more information in our website and uh, thank you uh, who, those who participated in today's colloquium. We hope to see you on uh, June 7th or June 12th and the recording will now start.